Welcome to another episode of the Two and Under podcast. We are the Southern Hemisphere's only dedicated Newcastle United podcast. I think that's still the case. We've been going since November and we are still the only dedicated Newcastle United podcast. So we're going well, we're going well. I've got, I'm Jack and I've got Craig with me. How are you, Craig? I'm spot on, mate. How are you doing? I'm very good. I can see from your background that you're ready to talk about today's uh, topic that we're going to talk about. Yeah, it's a hot topic that is all over social media right now. It should be a good one, this one. It is, and it's going to be one that's going to be around for many years to come, I think. We've got Bobby. How are you doing, Bobby? Good, Jack. How are you doing? I'm very good. I'm very good. So what we're going to talk about today is St. James's Park, um, the, the capacity uh, issue that's kind of come up um, over the last week, really. We've known that it's going to, we've known it's going to come up, uh, you know, the the capacity question for Newcastle, 52,000 is the capacity of St. James's Park, but there's going to be times when this become, becomes a hot topic and it goes into the news. It's a very emotive topic as well. People have got very strong views on it. But the reason we're talking about it now is because last week, um, at, well, at the minute, Newcastle have got approximately 30,000 season ticket holders. They don't release the information, but that's what we think they've got. Last week, there was 30,000 extra people in a queue to get to try and get their hands on 1,000 additional season tickets that were going out. Uh, there was a stipulation on that, that they had to have bought tickets in the pre- since 2019, I think it was. Yeah. So that, that even that was factoring out a lot of fans uh, who hadn't bought tickets in that time. Uh, and then on Tuesday this week, just gone, uh, there was, there was a, a queue for the membership. So... Bobby, you were in that queue, weren't you? What what was that? What was that all about? Um, yeah, it was just a membership, so basically you can get it any time. But um, I saw the advert come up, so I went, went on it, and I was twenty second, the twenty two thousandth in line um, for this basic membership that you can get at any time. Um, and I thought, no, nah, my wait time was over an hour, so mm-hmm. I thought, uh, no, nah, I don't think I can wait that long. I held out, and I thought, no, nah, I'll get it. Another day when there's not 20,000 people waiting. Yeah. And the reason that the people are getting the membership is because it seems pretty certain that that's going to be the only way for non-season ticket holders to be able to get hold of match tickets because mm. the each member now can apply for one ticket. So what's been happening recently, obviously towards the end of the Mike Ashley era, they were giving season tickets away. There, were, there was 10,000 half-season tickets they gave away, something like that. Uh, but now, obviously, there's this massive demand, and season ticket holders, because their members have been able to buy extra match tickets as well. So that's how my friends got market ticket for the Arsenal game, um, and you can you can have like friends and family linked as well. So if you're linked to certain to other people's numbers, you can get tickets together potentially. But the club have changed that down now, so it's only one ticket per membership that you can apply for. So. It seems pretty certain that every match is going to go to membership sale. And then, I mean, if demand ca- carries on like it is at the moment, they're going to sell out straight away. So it'll probably be a first come, first served kind of situation for membership tickets. Yep. Or it'll be um, like the queue, queue system that they've been, that they've been using. Um, I know that you, there was 30,000 in the queue for those 1,000 additional tickets, but some of that might have been people on multiple devices. But either way, you know, the, the demand is massive. Uh, yeah. Newcastle, United, Newcastle United are back. Um, the, the owners have breathed life into this sleeping giant football club and we, we're on a roll and everybody wants a piece of it. And Newcastle's a, a you know, football mad city anyway. So, you know, right now there is kind of unprecedented demand to go to St. James's Park due to a combination of the factors that we've just talked about. Craig, do you think this demand is going to continue? And if so, how long do you think it will last for? Uh, it's hard to say, you know. It's the, the demand, I think, actually blew everyone away. 30,000 people trying to get 1,000 tickets. It, it's it's insane. But it could only happen at one club, and that is our club. I don't think it will happen anywhere else. And I know it's a bit of a cliche, but I think it will go on for as long as we're on this snowball trail of the squad building and building and building. It will eventually plateau out to the point where we don't necessarily need to build anymore. We just need to strengthen in small spaces. And I think that's going to be the key point is, can we do it quick enough? 
uh, it'll still take maybe another two, three years. So that is probably my guesstimate of when we'll stop seeing that snowball effect of the big numbers trying to get the tickets in. Two, three years, I think, is a good time for him. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's, what, a five, six, seven-year waiting list for season tickets right now, purely because of that. Mm. And it's great to see because it's a good revenue thing for the club, which is something is another topic as well. Yeah. Well, the last time there was demand like this was when probably the mid-90s when the stadium mm. was eventually expanded. Uh, I think it was 2000, 2001. That was, it was went to 52,000 from 36,000. Uh, but before that, with the, when the entertainers, there was massive waiting list queues, you know, and it seems to be like that again. Bobby, do you think this, how long do you think this kind of demand will continue for? As long as there's hope. <laughs> as, long, as long as there's hope. It seems to be when there is hope in the air in Newcastle, everyone wants to be part of it. We're a one club city and it's just a snowball effect and you just see the connection it only takes a bit of hope for it to spark and then everyone wants to be part of it. And we're talking to Craig off air, the population of Newcastle is now in the metro in the North Pineside area is what, about a million people, Craig? Yep. So, yeah, and that's growing all the time. And we're saying young kids now are attracted to the club. They're not going to support the Liverpools and the, the Man Cities anymore because their local clubs got hope and a chance to, to win something. So... As long as that's there, mate, I think um, the demand will be there. I think that this would have happened regardless of the identity of the new owner as well. I think to an extent, yeah. you know, Ashley going was the big th- the big thing because we were selling out the championship when Benitez was here, 52,000, and that was when Ashley was there. And it was only really the last few years since Rafa left when, you know, Bruce Ball happened and people walked away. And I, I really feel sorry for people who, who chucked their season ticket at that point. When I was back when I was back in the UK, I chucked mine in 25th. It was 2050. It was when John Carver was there. So I think it was early 2015. Um, it was after that Leicester game where uh, Williamson and Jan might, might have been got sent off. It was just an absolute shambles, that game anyway. And I was, I remember I was outside, um, I was at work and I was going to a care home because I was, I was doing something with work and I, the, the direct, the first direct debit came out of my bank and I was like, mm, nah, I, I, I knew I was getting married soon as well. So I was like, I need as much money as I can get. And I just chucked it then. And I know that everybody, every fan will have had their own kind of point where they were going to, going to chuck it or where they couldn't tolerate anymore. And for a lot of people, that was when Rafa left and when, when Bruce came, yeah. Uh, yeah. so I really do feel bad for people who uh, who are now missing out, uh, and I don't envy the club for having to try and sort this situation out. Um, but it's not going to be a, a quick fix, you know. It's not going to be a, something that can happen overnight. Um, I should just say before we kind of go any further that none of us are kind of uh, architects or sort of construction experts. That we don't really know. You know, we're going to talk about what some of the options might be for extending the capacity, but. There's a lot of complications and a lot of variables that we we're not aware of, uh, yeah. and a lot of complications. So, this is just what what we think um, from a fan point of view, really. Um, and we, we are going to keep the emotion in it as well because we're fans, we're football fans, and that's what we do. Uh, but we'll try and look at it, you know, a little bit objectively as well if we can. Um, we did a we did a poll the other day on Twitter uh, from the Tune Under account. And it was just asking how big we think that the stadium needs to be for Newcastle in the long term. Uh, there was four options. We had fifty to sixty thousand. We had sixty to seventy thousand, seventy to eighty thousand, and eighty thousand uh, plus. So the result of that was that three percent thought fifty to sixty thousand, and twenty-eight percent thought sixty to seventy thousand. 41% thought seventy to eighty thousand, and twenty-eight percent thought eighty thousand plus. So 69% of fans that we polled, there was 1,000 respondents, 69% of those fans think we need at least a 70,000 capacity stadium. Just to put that in a little bit of context, the only current Premier League stadium that's above 70,000 is Old Trafford, and that's almost 75,000. Bobby, what do you think about that, uh, sort of the, the, the results of that, and how big do you think the stadium needs to be in the long term? Yeah, well, I'm one of those 
people in those percentile. I think it has to be over 70,000. Um, demand dictates it. I think this, we could easily cover 70,000 uh, fans. What that number looks like, I don't know. Like There'll be smarter people than, than I that can calculate and analyse exactly what the number should be. And then you've got the debate about if that number is too high, do we leave St. James and what is the cost associated with with that, not the financial cost, but the, the emotional and the cultural cost of all that. So I think when I put down 70 to 80,000, I thought, well, it's just demand. It's just the size of the club. Um, for years, we've been told we're not a big club, but we are a big club and this will prove it. Um, you know, the Camp New has 99,000 seat stadium mm. and that's not a one club city, is it? Um, so what what could the potential be? And are we looking now and five years down the track or 20 years down the track when, you know, Newcastle as a city grows, the population grows, we don't know what's around the corner. So, you know, the, the owners have said they're willing to invest in the city, not just the club. So how much of that investment in the city is going to bring people from other parts of the world and England to work and live there and then have families there and kids who want to support um, Newcastle United. So, yeah, it's just for me, it was like a nice number to be in that 70 to 80,000 because that puts us in the, the top of the tree and where the big clubs live. So that was my thought behind it. All right. Craig, what about you? Uh, I'm going to say 70 to 80,000, but what I want to know is I'll tell you we are Metro going to put in more trains. I've tried to get home when 52,000 people are trying to get one Metro from St. James's and it's the biggest pain in the arse possible. Um, <laughs> so they need to put more Metros on if uh, the stadium is going to increase or put more buses back up to the coast from uh, my end. But yeah, 70, 80,000, anything around the 70 plus is just going to be absolutely dominant. Whether it's at St. James's, whether it's at a new place, it'll just be an absolute cathedral of noise. And like Bobby says, the situation demands it. And we could even start off at 70 and then even grow on top of that as well, depending on uh, the situation, you know. And I can't wait for it to happen. And I think it'll start happening sooner rather than later. Look how quickly, I know it's a smaller scale, but the development of stuff at um, the Benton Training Ground, that literally started happening what overnight. They've got the planning permission build and work done so maybe things are getting worked in the background that we don't know about and mm. i'm longing for it to happen well they're not the biggest property developers in england owning the club so things like permits and getting in around council um noise and all that won't be a problem for the ruben so it could you could be right Craig. we could be already halfway down the line of extending or looking at different areas so yeah, it'd be interesting. And it's for people like me, Jack. Like, I'm looking to go to Newcastle from Australia. <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to get a membership for me, my wife, my two kids, because if I take them, well, I need a ticket. <laughs> and, I I, I, and it is virtually impossible for me, as Dimmy is finding it right now, to go to Newcastle and find a ticket at this this point. So, um, yeah, I think it's the situation. We're going to grow our worldwide fan base as well, just through mm -hmm. our success. So there's going to be people like us that come from a foreign country that want to go see the club. You've got to have that capacity to to allow them in to see. So, yeah. Dimmy, talk about Dimmy. He he's actually he's on his honeymoon. Right, he's going on his honeymoon in Greece, which is where his family is from. So he's going on his honeymoon there in uh, July, and he's actually booked flights already from Greece <laughs> to Newcastle. For the Nottingham Forest game, even though uh, he doesn't have a ticket yet, we're doing we're doing all we can to try and help him get a ticket. So if anyone watching or listening to this fancies giving a a mad Aussie a ticket, he's already got his flights. Taking time out of his honeymoon, he's he's the most mad sports fan that I think I've ever ever come across. Mm. Um, and we will get him a ticket somehow. Anyway, you will end up with a ticket, but. Yeah, so it's only one. he said he, he said he'll leave his wife at home. She doesn't have to come. So yeah, yeah, he's, <laughs> she's not going with him. Yeah, she's she's staying on the honeymoon, and he's going to Newcastle, and then he's yeah. flying out pretty much straight after the game to go yeah. back to Greece <laughs> via London. He has to go as well. So yeah, but going back to the stadium point, I just want to play devil's advocate a little bit here. I'm I'm not saying that I don't want us to have a seventy thousand seat plus seat stadium, 
But if you look at the other stadium capacities, right, you've got Old Trafford, which is almost 75,000. The next biggest is Spurs, which is 62,000. Um, and then the Emirates is 60,000, 61,000. West Ham, 60,000. You've got the Etihad, 55,000. And then you've got Anfield, which is 53,000. A couple of those are going to expand and they've got potential to expand. Uh, I think Villa are going to be expanding their, their ground as well. Although I don't yeah. really see the point because they don't really sell out very often <laughs> anyway. No, no. <laughs> but like Stamford Bridge is 41,000. And I, I know Chelsea have you know wanted to do something about that for a long time. Everton are move, going to be moving into a 53,000 seater. So even these new stadiums, even these brand new stadiums like the Spurs Stadium, are not touching anywhere near 70,000 really. Um, at, at this point in time, no one can say that we're a bigger club than Arsenal. Uh, we're certainly not a bigger club than Liverpool. Um, I, I went on Twitter and said that I didn't think Liverpool had any problems with a, a stadium that big. But then a few people did tell me that actually, you know, it's really hard to get tickets and people are having to pay 400, 500 pounds for a ticket for the games. Um, so I'm just interested in the fact that we, you know, we could extend St. James's Park potentially to 65,000 and would have the second biggest stadium in the UK. And I'm just I'm I'm interested in what the long term uh, demand is going to be, because even if we get success, you know, I'm I'm talking sort of like 15, 20 years. Yeah, I think even if we get success over time, I think the demand will flatten out. Uh, I don't. I think this is completely unprecedented what we're seeing at the moment. Um, I I just don't think we need like a massive sort of beer moth of a stadium, um, potentially for the long term. Uh, I, I'm not saying we wouldn't sell it out sometimes. We would sell it out right now, and I think we will sell it out at points in the future. Um, but it, it's interesting to me that Juventus, um, they they deliberately built a smaller stadium. So they, I mean, they, they didn't have, they didn't used to sell their stadium out, the massive stadium they had, but they built a purpose-built 41,000-seater. And PSG Stadium is about 48,000. So, you know, it, I just think it's interesting that the around Europe, you've got the new Camp, the Bernabeu, the Dortmund Stadium's huge, the San Siro, which obviously services two clubs, and the Allianz Arena, which is Bayern Munich, that's 75,000. So you just don't see, like, other than sort of Barcelona, Real, and Man United, you know, you just don't see these kind of massive, massive stadiums. Um, and we all hope that Newcastle are going to get there, um, and I think over time we will. Um, but I, I think that a stadium of kind of 65, between 65 and 70,000, I think would actually service us pretty well um, now and in the future. Uh, and I, I just, yeah, I, I wonder what they're going to do. And if, if we can do that and stay at St. James's Park, I think that would probably be preferable to moving somewhere else and building a massive 75, 80,000 seat stadium. That's just kind of my thoughts on it. Um, I don't know. What do you, what do you, either of you think about any of that? I, I agree with it. I mean, nobody wants to leave St. James's Park. There's not one fan out that says, yeah, we absolutely need a new stadium. Um, whether it be the fact that St. James's is uh, crumbling away, it's falling to pieces. It's not like how stadiums of old were. Uh, it just needs a little bit of TLC to bring it back up to uh, ship ship. And those stuff I've already seen with window cleaning, that sort of thing, you know. Uh, getting the uh, Gallagher end extended, that's going to be the key thing. Uh, whether that will get it to 60,000, 65,000, I think it depends on how smart the architectures are and they can fill the corners, that type of thing. I'm absolutely smack bang on with you on that, Jack. I think 60 to 65 is the perfect number for the foreseeable and then take it from there. And even again, like 10, 15 years from now, see what happens. The demand, like I said, will plateau out, it will flatten. And it will be a case of will we continue to fill it? But that's all down to success. And like Bobby said, hope. Hope fills a lot of people's hearts around on Tyneside. And if we can bring success, that brings hope and that brings people bums on seats. Yeah. Even if, I, so, go on, Bobby. No, no, you go. Yeah. I was going to say, even if we do build a brand new stadium, it's going to take a decade probably. You know, it could take 10 years. It could take, it could take, I, I was reading an article from a guy called Stephen Hodgson, uh, who wrote for True Faith, um, and he's a char chartered construction professional. And he thought a, new, a brand new stadium could take anywhere between 10 and 15 years just because of the stakeholder engagement. 
uh, everybody you have to talk to, all of these things that you don't really see or think about when you're a football fan. Um, but when you're trying to get any kind of major major building or major construction happening, especially if it's in a city centre, you know, these things are going to take take a long time. And who knows what, you know, we might have won the Champions League in 10 years or <laughs> <laughs> we might not have. Who knows? What were you going to say, Bobby? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a hard one. Like, if you said to me, we can get St. James's Park to 68,000, but we can build a new stadium for 75,000, I would say stay at St. James. Mm, yeah, you know, absolutely. That's, that, that's, that's my thoughts on it. The, the interesting thing you were talking about, the Liverpools and the Arsenals and the Tottenham's, and, you know, they're not... We are so unique in that we've got a, a city behind the one club. Mm-hmm. All these other clubs, like London is so populated by so many teams that for Spurs to have 65,000 is a great effort. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I think Newcastle at 65 would be in five years' time the same problems as we're seeing at, at 52. Mm. And that's why like I go to my local council and NAL, you know, uh, Ballarat meetings about, you know, expansion and train lines and what are we doing? And my my number one question to these people is, it's going to take 10 years to build, so what's the problem's going to be in 10 years? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're only building to, to get to the same point in 10 years' time. Well, why don't we build for 50 years' time? Do you know what I mean? And, and then and get to that point. So it's it's interesting. Like I think... Um, Sixty-five thousand is a good number. I think around that will be will be okay. I wouldn't complain so long as it's at St James. I'm not mm-hmm. don't want to build a new stadium at sixty-five. I think mm-hmm. that's a bit pointless. Yeah. So obviously, one of the big advantages of having a bigger stadium would be the new fact, like more fans would get the chance to go to the game. You know, that's probably the number one um, pressing issue at the moment is that fans want to be able to go to the game. Uh, and as a as a fans, that's always going to be the most important thing for us. We were just talking about, you know, we don't go to many games because we live ten thousand um, miles away. But uh, when we do go back, we want to be able to go to the game, and it would be pretty devastating if we went back and we couldn't get a ticket. <laughs> but um, one of the other reasons is for the ticket and income, and just a couple of figures for this interested me. So. Our ticket income in 2019, so this was when Rafa was still there, when we had the we had an average of about 51,000. The whole um, income from tickets was 24.8 million at that season. So the, the total commercial income of the same season was 26.2 million. So that's pretty similar. And we know that there's going to be there's, there's massive scope to increase the commercial activity for Newcastle. And that's going to, we've already seen that with the sleeve sponsorship. And that's something that's going to going to help us a lot going forward with financial fair play as we grow as well. But the total broadcasting revenue for that time, right? So the tickets were 25 million. Commercial income is about 26 million. The broadcasting income was 124 million. So the broadcasting income is five times what you get from tickets anyway. Um, so even if we were to sell an extra an extra 15,000 tickets per game. It's not even going to come close to kind of matching what the what the broadcasting revenue is. Um, so that's that when you when you're looking at the cost of building a new stadium um, or expanding or the all the complications it's going to going to be that will be factored in, in. I think the fact is probably going to be less than the commercial income and it's probably going to be less than the broadcasting income. So if we've got if we're selling out a fifty two thousand seat stadium and we're getting that TV income. Would there be more TV income if we're selling out sixty five thousand or seventy five thousand? Would there be bigger games naturally that would gear us towards more TV spots, more advertisement, more? That's my question. I, well, I, I don't know. I don't know how it particularly works, but I'd imagine that if there's more people at the stadium, more interest in the game, it could bring in more revenue for the TV money as well. Yeah, the TV money is centrally. Um negotiated by the Premier League. So one club, I mean, the product for the Premier League, if that's if the product is better, then they're going to get bigger uh, bigger commercial deals with the TV companies. So I guess that's where that would fit in. Um, but there's all, there's all sorts of other kind of commercial opportunities, I suppose, if we've got a bigger stadium and if we've got a successful team. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's probably, there probably is factors there that would, that would come into it. But I was just really quite struck by that. Uh, we yeah. know that... We know that the, the 
the tickets are not they used to be the kind of the be all and end all uh, and they are they are in the lower leagues as well which is why covid's really badly hit some of the lower leagues and the french league has been really badly hit by the by covid as well because they stopped selling tickets and their tv deal collapsed um but i was just quite interested by that um, and the other the other thing is with a new stadium it's the corporate money as well so this is something that spurs have gone really big on with getting the um getting those those other events like the nfl uh, and i was listening to kieran maguire's podcast the other day and he was talking about liverpool and their corporate so what they actually do is they out they outsource some of it so they have they have the corporate people go to aintree the race course yeah uh, and then they just bust them in for, to the football so they just have to save the seats they don't actually have to save boxes or anything like that so these are these are things that um that will be taken into account i think and that will be factored into any it's it's a really complicated sort of picture isn't it when you start digging into it a little bit uh, it's not as easy as you know we can sell more tickets we need a bigger stadium let's go and build one or let's extend St James's Park <laughs> when you start thinking about it it's quite complicated really yeah that corporate thing that you're talking about is, is actually a big factor that I didn't think of like to make the corporate area bigger and better so that the the sponsors and the new like we're, our corporate area is going to grow substantially, isn't it? So you want to mm-hmm. wine and dine these people to spend more money on the club. So it's a big factor in expansion of St. James or going to a new stadium is, is it fit for purpose for that result? Because we want to have our corporates come to a place where they want to be part of, you know, be mm-hmm. part of the club. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting and luckily smarter people than us will be deciding <laughs> this, but... Um, yeah, let's just hope, uh, you know, to leave St. James's Park will, will be a monumental decision that I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't see comfortably with. No, yeah, absolutely not. We're gonna, um, we're gonna talk about a few of the possible options then. That I think we're all agreed that we do need a bigger stadium. Uh, the, the owners have said that, but Craig, we were talking about um, a pretty, um, what, how can you say this? A pretty headline grabbing quote from Murdad Gadusi. Uh, mm-hmm. Back in, I think it might be in February. But can you just remind us exactly what he said uh, before we um, sort of think about what we think about what he said? Yep, can indeed. So, St James's Park is unique, special, the cathedral of the city, sitting on its hill. We will definitely look at expanding it, working with the city and council to see what we can do. There's a lot of things that need to happen first, but that's the way forward. If we can get to 60 or 65,000, amazing. And we will look at it every possibility. But are we going to build a new stadium? No. it would be like tearing your soul out. That gets me right there. That really, really does. I remember at the time we were talking about that and you said that that made you feel... And it does make you feel emotional as a fan, doesn't it? Because you've got... genuinely does. You've got owners who have got no kind of prior connection to the club coming in and they're, they're talking like supporters. Um, the same, the fact, the kind of things that they feel at the moment because they're excited and because they're they've been probably swept up in it just as much as everybody else has been. But he he's made a commitment. He's made a commitment there that we're not going to leave St James's Park. Could he? Yeah. Could he come? Could he? Could he come back and regret regret that quote? He could do. He very well could do. And. As long as they, like they've said, they have explored every single possibility, and if it's not feasible then fair enough. They can say, look, we looked at it. It's commercially not going to make sense because we can't get enough seats in to make a difference. This is what we're going to have to do moving forward. Perfectly happy with that. Not a problem at all. But as long as, like they say, they have explored every single possibility, they've not left any stone unturned. And that land behind St. James's Park, I think that is key. And we all know he who should not be named uh, sold that off a good while ago. But I think the company that bought that, they went bust. Or they did go bust. Or I don't know what's happened with it since. So maybe that land is back off for sale. Who knows? But I, I do think if we can get it to 60, 65, like Murdad said, then that we if is discussed as the sweet spot, I think. And in keep up to that promise, then, you know, they'll be replacing uh, Gray's monument with a statue of him in a few years' time or whatever, you know. Uh, that would be the way I would say it. <laughs> that would be genuinely the icing on the cake if he can hold to that promise. What do you reckon about that, Bobby, about what Medad said? 
Beep, beep, beep. There's going to be some backtracking. Up, up, up. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. I love Merdad. I love him. I think he's like me, but no connection to the city other than that we just fell in love with the place. But we, we he does genuinely love the club. He loves the city. He loves the fans. And he just got so emotive that he made a comment, a bit like his wife, um, that um, probably shouldn't have because. Mm. That comment's going to hurt if we do eventually leave St. James because I think that's going to be an emotional day. Now, there'll be fans. I don't think there'll be any fans that don't support Newcastle that do watch this podcast and think, what are you talking about? It's just a ground. But we truly know, I've been there three or four times, how special that ground is and why it's special. And for him to make a comment like that, it, it gives you goosebumps, but then at the same time you go, well, you don't want to leave now. You, you don't want to, mm. to demolish that and go and build a new stadium. So, yeah, it's interesting, that comment. <laughs> um, I hope it's true. I hope they find a way. Really, I do. I hope we can get to 60, 65, and this can be a problem in five or ten years' time that we talk about again about expansion or moving. <laughs> but, um, yeah, let's see how that plays out. Shades of uh, when Pardew said that we are not selling Andy Carroll under any circumstances. And then he got sold. <laughs> that, yeah. any, any say whatsoever in that. But yeah, I, I don't think Murdad will be, as long as nothing else has gone badly wrong, and as long as they've still got credit in the bank, and as long as they haven't done anything horrendous, I, I, I think he, he won't be too harshly criticised for that quote, but probably, because he's obviously just excited. And he was it, it was in an interview, it wasn't about the stadium, the interview, it was about... I think it was just about everything else, and it was with it was with um, Amanda Stavely as well. And they've just said something that because they got excited, because <laughs> that's how they feel at that time, which is what you want to say. I think logical supporters will not hound them for that comment, but as you know, and we see on Twitter, there's a lot of illogical people that do support our club, and um, the comment will come back by. But you know, I think they mean well, and as long as the owners mean well, they'll always have the benefit of doubt with me anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Um, but I'm I'm all for them talking like that uh, to an extent, and um, just as long as, uh, and I think they will get probably get a bit more savvy um, as things progress, uh, or or when they do make an unpopular decision, which I keep th- like I think I've just been I just know what happens with football club owners a lot of the time where they do end up making unpopular decisions and. Even the Fenway group at Liverpool have, you know, um, that they've then had to backtrack on. Um, so I th- and I think it's always good to have that kind of wary scepticism um, to an extent. So, um, But everything they've done so far and everything they've said has been great. Newcastle have played at St. James's Park for 130 years for their whole history. Um, for me, if we moved for, from St. James's Park, it would be very hard to take. Mm-hmm. Um but I understand. I'll probably well understand if it's the only um, option to get the club to to grow. Um, and if if everything else has been exhausted, I'm not sure what you know what could, else could be done about it. Really, um, we'll just have a little look at three of the sort of options. Um, and this is where we're kind of delving into territory that you know, unless you're some kind of um, architect or somebody who's actually looked into this in detail this is just kind of speculation really um based on a few things that we've looked at and what we've read but as i was talking before about that article from stephen hodgson he thinks that we could extend st james's park so we could extend the gallagher stand by eight thousand, which would take us to sixty thousand, and that has been complicated by actually selling that land um and also by the fact the metro station is there um, but he was also talking about uh, he thinks that you could potentially r- raise the height of the east stand as well. So without encroaching onto the Leeser's Terrace and St. James's Terrace, which are the listed buildings. And he thought that that potentially we could extend those um, those two to a, a capacity of 65,000 um, at a cost of 250 to 400 million, somewhere between 250 and 400 million. So, he, you know... I don't know if that's feasible or if that's, but if we can, I think what you were saying before, boy, if we can get St. James's to 65,000, 
and that's what Stephen, the, the guy who wrote the article, said. He thinks in the medium term that would be a good approach, but then he mm. he does think that in the long term we might need to move to a new stadium anyway. What do you what would you think about that happening? Um, yeah, well, I think that'd be perfect if it could be feasibly done. Getting St George's to sixty five thousand would be bloody unreal, especially the Gallagher extended and and the East End. Like the place would be rocking, and the noise it would just be unreal coming bouncing off the gallery, get into the leases through the east. It'll just be, it'll be mad. So, yeah, that that would be the perfect scenario. And then, as I said, deal with what may come in five, ten years' time about capacity and moving, and 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 save that for another day. Because who knows in ten years' time what might happen? The Premier League might lose its appeal, and you know people start jumping off, or who knows? But mm. yeah, that. That situation for me is perfect. Something Mitch, uh, the Geordie dentist on Twitter, something he pointed to the other day was that he knows somebody or he's spoken to somebody who had talked about option two, which could be to to move the pitch um, clo- further away from the Leeser's Terrace um, towards Barrack Road and then rebuild the stands. So the, the guy thought that that could be done in like a, a graduated kind of way. So the that the team could still continue playing at St James's Park, but the capacity would be reduced at different times of the build. Uh, he he, and then he thought that could get to seventy seventy five thousand if we did that. So that could be an option. It sounds quite complicated, doesn't it, Craig? Yeah, rotating the pitch, other than going to move the Gallagher end to the other side again, and I don't know how that would work. It would be a bit complex, but you know that's what these uh, architects get. Architects get paid millions to do. Uh, we'll let them have that headache and we'll just look forward to the new build. But um, again, Stephen, who wrote in The True Faith, was talking about clubs just don't often stay in grounds while they're getting redeveloped. Uh, when Spurs got redeveloped, they moved to Wembley and because it's just too hard. Like It's too logistically and for safety mm-hmm. reasons, it's too difficult. How do you feel, Craig, about playing at the Stadium of Life for a couple of years? Um... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, I can't even think about that. Oh, that just makes me think of third. I want to go for shower now. Um, I'd rather go across, I think it was at the A52 and play Carlisle. <laughs> I'd rather go over there, you know, or uh, just jump over the border and play in one of the uh, Scottish teams, play the uh, Ibrox, something like that. But I don't want to play just, there. Can, no can we just go play at Gateshead? What if he cares? Yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, my old school um, team, uh, school football field, you know, put a couple of stands there. It was a pretty big uh, green area. And probably better atmosphere than the shithole down on we are saying. It's funny. It's funny in, in Australia, right? So this was a bit of a cultural um, something that I noticed when I moved here with sports. Clubs just play like home games in different stadiums, don't they, Bobby? It's like you've got like AFL clubs who will just go to Tassie to play a home game or to Darwin or something like that. It's the culture's different, isn't it? I wish Keegan was here because it's a very hot, it's a very hard topic for Geelong fans to get their head around that. Yeah, they've got they've got a forty thousand seat stadium, but they play all their home games or most of their home games at the MCG and all Melbourne. the finals games. And yeah, against Richmond, they're the home team. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just, and like our fans sit together. Like I remember my mm-hmm. stepdad; he's from um, Nuneaton, Birmingham area, and the first time we took him to an Essendon Carlton game, we sat down first and. My, my family go for Essendon and, and then there was Carlton supporters sitting next to him and he shit his pants. He's like, what's going on? Like, are we in the wrong area? And I said, no, no, we just sit together. And he couldn't get his head around that fact. So, yeah, a lot of cultural differences here, Jackie. I think we can definitely rule out Newcastle playing at, St. J- uh, at the Stadium of Light. Uh, yeah, never happened. Just just to even get the fans there, like, it would just be absolute... I, I was just trying to imagine it earlier and I was like, it would be yeah. absolute chaos. It would be perfect because we just replicate what their fans do, shit in the seats. <laughs> or, or don't turn up. <laughs> oh, yeah. If Murdad's listening, don't talk to Sunderland about his, uh, about his playing at <laughs> their stadium. Exactly. Everyone's so, already tripled job. You don't have to get a fourth one. <laughs> <laughs> so the last the last option, the, third, the, the big kind of, you kind of say the nuclear option would be to move away from St. James's Park, uh, to move away from the site, and to move to a different a different area, a different site. So in 1997, there was a plan before we extended to 52,000. There was a plan to, and they had like they had the drawings done up, and they had they were going through approvals and everything for this. But it, it was a lot of 
um, opposition to it. But there was a plan to build a stadium in Leeds' Park, um, which is just behind kind of St. James's Park. Um, for those who might, might be in Australia who don't know, um, it's it's not far. Um, but there's there's issues there because there's kind of um, it's a conservation area, a lot of that area. So there might have to be some sort of land kind of swap. So we turn the current St. James's into like a green area or something like that, you know, but even that, like moving the stadium sort of a kilometer away is going to cause massive, massive um, problems for the, the, the various people who need to be consulted about these things. So that you can just see how complicated that could potentially get straight away. Another site that has been talked about is the Metro Radio Arena. I don't know if it's called that anymore now, but uh, the land there, which is down by the river, um, which is still fairly central. Um, I think, for me, if the stadium is to move, it has to still be as cent- close to the centre of the town as, as possible. <clears throat> St. James's Park, there's there's that thing about St. James's Park is within walking distance to something. There's something like a hundred and 103 40. pubs within like a mile or something of St. James's Park. And that's that's such a, a unique and special thing. And, you know, I think Murdad knows that from what he was saying in his interview. But that's, for me, that's the real key. So if we do move, then we have to still be in the city centre or as close to the city centre as possible. Thoughts about that, Craig? Absolutely, yeah. Do not move it anywhere else. Uh, I know there was very brief talk about moving to um, Paddy Freeman's Park. Uh, where they do the Hoppins, uh, moving oh, yeah. that way. Um, that is, that's the biggest open land space in the UK, I think, within a, like a metropolitan area. It's bigger than uh, Hyde Park in London. Uh, so that's just a sense of scale for anybody who doesn't know. So that is an area, it's not that far away from St. James's Park, but it would kind of keep it in the city. I think that would be the only place where they could, but again, it's getting the permission, moving to it. But um Staying central to the city is an absolute must. One of the key things and benefits of St. James's is its location. It's ridiculously easy to get to. If we move there, though, where's Alan Shearer going to graze his cows? <laughs> That's where the if Freeman they can graze. Put the new patch at uh, St. James's. They can plant strawberries again there if they want to. <laughs> he, 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 can take it to where, he can take it to where Michael Owen has his horses. <laughs> <laughs> Shearer can graze his cows wherever he wants. <laughs> he can indeed. What do you. What do you think about that, Bobby? The kind of the idea about a, a new stadium or moving from the city. And so this is coming from an Australian that's visited Newcastle. So I, I wasn't born there. I don't have the emotional connection that you guys do, and it would tear my heart out to move from St James Park. So I, I dare say I don't know what you guys would feel if it happened. So um, even to Lees's Park, it's just not the same, is it? It's it's not St James's Park. It's not that cathedral on the hill. It's not, mm. you know, um, the history of walking up the, those staircases or or anything like that. You know, I, I just being across the road from the strawberry and and just little things like the it's the intangibles that you take for granted that when you don't go for years that you always reminisce about that will be lost. And I don't. Worst case scenario, if we move from um, from St James's Park. Mm. Well, this is gonna this is gonna run and run. This it's uh, it's not gonna be something that's solved quickly. It's gonna flare up from time to time when people can't get tickets for for matches. Um, but it's gonna be kind of you're talking decade at least. You know, uh, I think things can be put in put into motion. Um, and I, I trust that the the new owners are gonna do everything they can. To <laughs> if only because Murdad isn't going to want to have to uh, backtrack on that comment he made, but I think they do know that that that's kind of the got to be what what most people want to do, and um, so they'll just have to weigh absolutely everything up, have to get all the advice they can from people who actually know what they're talking about, mm-hmm. um, not from the tune under pod, and they'll uh, see see where they go with it. But we'll, we'll I'm sure we'll be talking about this again many times in the future. I think we'll leave it there for now. I'm not sure we've solved anything, but we've had a good, good chat. We're all we're all agreed that we shouldn't be moving from St James's Park if at all possible. Um, we'll leave it there. Um, we will be back later this week to do the next part in our season reviews of the classic seasons. We're going to be looking at 2002, 2003, which was the European season. 
Um, so I will be back for that and I'll be joined for that way by Craig and Bobby as well. So we'll see you then, guys. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.